Listen to Psalm 89, verses 1 and 2 from God's inerrant word for our call to worship this morning. I will sing of the loving kindness of the Lord forever. To all generations I will make known your faithfulness with my mouth. For I have said, loving kindness will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. Shall we continue to worship by turning in our hymnals to hymn number 51 as we stand and sing to the glory of God. Number 51. Shall we stand and sing together? Father, we lift our voices certainly in praise and in thanksgiving unto you, thanking you for the blessings that are a part of our life daily. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the greatest blessing of all, knowing Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Bless us, O Heavenly Father, with the ministering power of your Holy Spirit. May it be evident within this, your house of worship today, and may your name be lifted up, let it be praised. And let it be glorified, for we ask and pray it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and please be seated. And good morning. We welcome each and every one of you into God's house this morning. We know that he's going to bless you in this hour that we worship him together. And I greet you in the name of a risen and a soon coming again Savior. I want you to turn to someone sitting alongside of you, in back of you, in front of you. Extend a right hand of fellowship and greet one another in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> Just a few announcements to share with you this morning. As always, I call your attention to those friendship pads. They're directly in front of you in the pew there. It only takes a moment. You sign it, you pass it along, it's a great help at our ministry here. Now this evening at 6.30, our book club ministry will be meeting. They invite you to come and be a part of their fellowship, one with the other, and you'll have a great time. And remember, it's at tonight at 6.30, our book club ministry. Wednesday evening at 7 p.m., it's a midweek pause that refreshes. All our youth groups will be me meeting, and Pastor Dave and the adults will be praying and studying together, looking up when life gets you down. Wednesday evening at 8 p.m., Zumba Fitness on our lower level. And then Friday morning at 7 a.m., we have Zumba Fitness on our lower level. If you can take advantage of that, we invite you to do so. And then Friday evening from 5 until 7 p.m., is a spaghetti dinner. There's an insert in your bulletin. And there's a snow date on here, which we're going to disregard completely. Uh, definitely. Uh, well, all we ask you to do is to please fill this out at the bottom 
let us know you're coming, how many are coming with you, so we might be able to prepare for this spaghetti dinner. And today, today is the last day that you can sign up. So please keep that in mind if you would. There's also a flyer in your bulletin concerning some upcoming events coming up very shortly. And you want to be a part of it and be in your place and be in time and receive the blessing that God has in store for you. Also on April the 6th, April the 6th at 11 a.m., we want you to come and share in the dedication service of our six newly restored stained glass windows. So that's on April the 6th. Please make a note of it. Come and be blessed with the dedication service that we have in store. Our flowers this morning, they are presented to the glory of God. And one is in loving memory of Buck Pearson from his wife Ethel and family. The second is in loving memory of Betty and Bud Crane's birthday from Joanne, Bob, and family. And we thank you so much for beautifying our sanctuary this morning. I'm going to ask the ushers if they will to come forward now as we continue to worship our living Lord by giving unto him our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. stand and sing our doxology together.
Our Heavenly Father, we continue to praise you, praise you, and thank you for your blessings. Praise and thank you, Heavenly Father, you called us to be servants of you. Called us, our Heavenly Father, to spread the gospel throughout all over the world. Called us, our Heavenly Father, to bring the treasures into the storehouse that you might bless them. And this we do. And we'd ask your Heavenly Father, your blessings certainly be upon these gifts, these tithes, these offerings. Our Heavenly Father, may they be used, used only in accordance with your will and always to your honor and glory. For we ask and pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The songs of praise we now sing can't compare to the songs we'll sing and the way we'll worship when Jesus returns in all his glory. We don't know when it will happen, but every dawn brings us closer to that glorious day.
Yes, indeed, the King is coming, amen? amen? And we don't know when that will be, but choir, thank you for stirring us up with that truth today. That gave me spiritual chills, and I pray that it did for you as well. What a blessing that was to hear the truth of God's word sung so beautifully, so powerfully. And thank you also for the video operators who helped uh, to add to the effect of the, the blessing. Amen? Amen indeed. Thank you very much. Well, the king is coming. The scriptures tell us we do not know when, but we are to always be prepared. And uh, Satan is lying to people. Oh, you've heard that for years and years and years. He hasn't come yet. And that's true. But that doesn't mean he's not coming. And uh, we must be ready. So part of being ready is to do what we can to serve the Lord wherever we go personally and as a church. One of the things God called us to do is pray for the nation and our leaders. That includes our state and all our local communities. And boy, do we need to pray, yes? And uh, so let's pray for God to uh, lead the people who lead us. Now, uh, one name not on our prayer list, it should be on there, Buddy Lamphere, Connie's husband. Uh, with all the stress of taking care of Connie, uh, has had a toll, and he is uh, feeling the effect of that, so he's doing okay, but let's, let's add him to the prayer list as well. Uh, Sharon Besser is home recuperating. Uh, June Dzinski and Ed Pinter and Marty Hughes, Gloria Jones, all recovering from surgeries and difficulties. Connie Lamphere with her treatment and Shirley Ebersol, Chuck Marshall, Walter Crane, Joanne's brother, uh, and everyone else that's on our prayer list certainly needs our prayer support and our love. And so let's be sure to do that all this week. Now our missionary for the week, Ruth Bodine's brother, Steve, and uh, sister-in-law, Sandy, and Harold's brother and sister-in-law. Uh, they are, he's a Bible professor through the Africa Inland Mission in Nairobi. He is part of the uh, Bible college that teaches Africans to become missionaries and evangelists. And so it's a marvelous ministry that they have there that we support financially and then all of this week prayerfully. Let's go to prayer together and you pray individually in your own personal way and then I'll ask you to join me in prayer. Let's pray together. O oh, living God Almighty, most glorious Heavenly Father, we thank you for those precious, countless blessings that you bestow upon everyone, but especially we who know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we, we count these blessings to be even more cherished because we know they're by your hand of grace, because you love us. We know, Father, that you bestow upon us life-changing blessings like eternal life, forgiveness of all sins, salvation. Your moment-by-moment -moment walk with us in the good days and in the difficult moments. These are blessings, Heavenly Father, that keep us motivated to love you and to worship you as you love us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that whenever we call upon you at your throne of grace, in the matchless saving name of Jesus Christ, you hear our prayers and powerfully answer our prayers. So we praise you, we worship you, we uplift your holy name. Father, we are so glad to know the truth that whenever we go astray from your will and disobey your word and grievously sin against you that you do not forsake us you do not abandon us how we thank you for that but you love us and even though you're grieved Heavenly Father you have promised us 
that whenever we confess and repent of our sins, you respond with your cleansing and how, what a cherished blessing that is. Glorious Father, we thank you that we live in the land where we can freely and publicly worship you and we think of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who do not enjoy this blessing. And so we pray for them. We pray that they will persevere in their faith, continue in their witness for Christ, even though they are being persecuted for doing so. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for our brothers and sisters in Christ in this land, that we will be encouraged as we serve you wherever we go. Guide and direct our leaders, Heavenly Father, in these confusing times. You are sovereign in all matters, matters, including the complications of this world and of this nation. Heavenly Father, we pray for those that we know by name and the many more that are nameless to us, but not to you, who live in spiritual darkness without Jesus Christ as Savior. Father, we ask that you melt the, wall, the walls of resistance and bring them to repentance, which is your desire to do so. Father God, may we be your helping hand in the lives of others who are hungry, who are hurting. Whatever the need is, enable us to be part of you meeting that need. We thank you, Heavenly Father, we can take the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever we personally go. But we pray for Steve and Sandy Murad that they will be given your wisdom, your strength to teach young people the word of God so that they might go forth and teach it to others. Now we thank you for blessing our hearts here this morning. You know every need that we have on our minds and within our lives and bear within our hearts. And you know how to meet that need. Touch our hearts and our minds afresh. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We're glad for your written word. We praise you for our living, wonderful Savior, the King of Kings. Hear our prayers. We offered by faith with complete trust. In the name of Jesus Christ and all believers joined and said together, Amen. Let's stand and sing together another song of truth. 211, there is a Redeemer. Let's stand and sing together, please. Let's stand and sing together.
Thank you. Please be seated. Would you open your Bibles, please, with me to the second letter of Peter, chapter 1. Last week, God graciously allowed us to be in the second Peter, chapter 1, the first four verses, and uh, today we'll be in verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. And then, Lord willing, next Sunday we'll come right back to the same portion of Scripture together. Let us hear God's infallible word as he perfectly inspired the Apostle Peter to write to believers of his day and by his divine wisdom of our day, beginning with verse 5 through verse 8. Now for this reason also, applying all diligence... In your faith supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence knowledge, and in your knowledge self-control, and in your self-control perseverance, and in your perseverance godliness, and in your godliness brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may God add his blessing upon this, the reading of his holy word. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your written word. We know that you perfectly inspired Peter to write it for our blessing here today. We we thank you for your divine wisdom. We thank you for loving us to provide us your word, to teach us, to edify us, to uplift us, to encourage us, to change us. All to your honor and glory. We pray for anyone in this place of worship or watching on the internet or by television who may not know Jesus Christ as his or her Savior that the Holy Spirit will bring that soul to salvation this day to your honor and glory alone. We commend ourselves to your spiritual watch, watch care. Thank you for your desire to uplift us in the loving name of Jesus Christ. We humbly ask this prayer together. And again, all believers joined and said together, Amen. I haven't heard this phrase in a long time. But when I was a child and a teenager and even a young adult, when I would act immaturely or speak immaturely or even express an immature thought, my parents or someone would say, grow up. I don't know if anybody says that today anymore, but grow up. And in essence, that's what God is saying here in 2 Peter chapter 1 to believers. In their day, new believers. In our day, believers that have been around for some time in the faith. Let's go back to, bound, to verse 1 in bond servant, a, a servant who was willingly acting like a slave to the master, only voluntarily so. And if we're not acting as bond servants, God is saying, grow up. If we're not in verse 2, following the, uh, growing in the knowledge of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, God is saying, grow up. If we believers who proclaim Jesus Christ our Savior in verse 3 are not relying on God's power, divine power, and instead of relying on our own power to get through each day, God is saying, you need to grow up. If you're not seeking to be uh, living godly lives, you need to grow up. If you're not seeking to bring glory and excellence to God's name, we need to grow up. And in verse 4, if we're not relying on the magnificent promises of God, God says, grow up. Spiritual growth is like physical growth. It takes time. 
You can't expect a five-year-old to be able to have the strength of an 18-year-old. Takes time. Takes time for spiritual growth. But there ought to be growth all the way. If you proclaim Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, you ought to be, look at your life today, right now. Not someone else, you, as I look at myself. And I remind you, you've only heard this sermon in a half hour's time. I've spent hours with this. So I've had to deal with this for hours. So don't examine someone else, examine yourself. You ought to be able to look back today to six weeks ago, six months ago, six years ago, whatever time span you give, and say, you know what, I see that I'm growing. If not, God is saying to you, grow up. On a scale of one to ten, with one being stagnant, I ain't grown nothing. To ten, where I'm, I'm seeking the Holy Spirit to continue to help me to grow. Between number one and number ten, what's your level scale, your scale growth? Don't ask somebody else. Don't look at somebody else. Look at yourself. As I look at myself as well. And in verse five through verse seven, we see seven characteristics of spiritual growth. It's easy to misunderstand counsel of others sometimes, but there was, the story is told of a guy named Charlie Stink. His last name is Stink, S-T-I-N-K. And for years, he was a subject of verbal uh, jokes and abuse and, you know, for that name. And his friends, as he got older, said, you know, Charlie, you got to change your name and avoid all this. He said, ah, how do you do that? He said, well, they said, well, you get a lawyer and you go to court and you get your name legally changed. He said, I'm going to do that. So he did. And a few months later, he meets with these friends and he said, well, I did it. I changed my name. They said, really? What's your new name? He said, George Stink. But for the legal... I don't understand what difference that's going to make. He didn't get it, obviously. But hopefully you'll get these seven characteristics of spiritual growth. And measure yourself. How you doing in growing in these areas? The first area is virtue. Moral excellence, virtue in verse 5. We ought to be living examples of morality in our own lives. We are living in a society that you know and I know is rapidly becoming more immoral and less moral. We ought to be examples of standards. We might be ridiculed for it. We might be laughed at. We might be, be rejected. People might give you the old stink eye to talk about stink. They might look at you like, what is wrong with you? Get on with life. Let's have fun. Do it. Oh, that's old. That's antique. Nevertheless, my level of moral excellence, my level of being a virtuous Christian is, needs to be increasing. Then in verse 5, he says, grow in knowledge. Knowledge of God's Word. Right here. Knowing God's Word. Knowing uh, our Christian faith. Growing in the knowledge of God. The Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We ought to be able to say, you know, I know more about this Word than I did a few months ago. That's growth. Let me just ask you a few questions. Don't answer, don't raise your hands. You can be totally honest because it's only between you and God. Do you think God is pleased or do you think Satan is pleased when believers 
people who proclaim Jesus Christ as Savior, do you think God is pleased or do you think Satan is pleased when believers say, I don't need to come to Sunday school or Bible study. I'm an adult. I've got better things to do. Do you think God is pleased or do you think Satan is pleased when we don't have time to read God's word, don't care about reading God's word? It's too confusing. I don't understand all those words. Do you think God is pleased or do you think Satan is pleased when believers say, I don't need to come to church anymore. I'm way beyond that. Church means nothing to me. Do you think God is pleased or do you think Satan is pleased? Oh, I could go on and on and on with the list and so could you. But really, believers, let's be honest. There is no way that God is pleased at all with disobeying his word and his will. Absolutely no way. We can rationalize it. We can justify it. We can excuse it. We can explain it away. God, you understand, of course, don't you? I don't think so. So if God isn't pleased, who then is pleased? Satan is pleased. Satan is pleased. The one who hates us. Satan hates every person in the world. Satan wants to destroy every person in the world. He wants to destroy families. He wants parent against parent and children against parents and parents against children. He wants divided families. He wants to ruin local churches like ours. That's what pleases Satan. He wants everyone to live in hell forever. That's what pleases Satan. Why in the world are we seeking to please Satan instead of God who only wants to deliver us and bring us home for all eternity? So what's your level of knowledge? Is it growing or are we stagnant? There's a third characteristic here, self-control in verse 6. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. God says, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that rules his spirit is better than he who takes a city. Wow. That's what God says. If you control your anger, you're better than the mighty. Wow. Because we all have buttons. I mean, the stuff that makes you angry doesn't make me angry. The stuff that makes me angry doesn't make you angry, perhaps. But we know about anger, don't we? If we're honest, God is saying, you know, if you would control that anger through the Holy Spirit, you would be mighty. He says in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28, he who has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Self-control. This is a true story. Miami Herald newspaper reported this on April the 10th, 1985. Concert pianist Van Clyburn, Clyburn was uh, performing a concert in Miami. And during the concert, a man streaked across the platform completely naked. And the audience went gasp. They, uh, they were shocked. Van Clyburn? just kept playing. And that calmed the audience down. And I don't know what happened to the guy. I guess he got arrested. But that would be self-control. Athletes have self-control. We need self-control. People have gone crazy wherever we look. There's a lot of good people. I'm not bashing people as if everybody in the world is... is weird but and wrong but don't you think people have just they've lost it throwing hissy fits in stores for no reason I mean I was in the Wawa a few days ago I know that's a shock to you but uh, my name is P 
Pastor Dave Wawa Meldrum, I, you know. But here was a teenager, and I'm not bashing teenagers, I'm just saying that I got it, I don't know, 14, 16, whatever, having a hissy fit because her father would not buy her what she wanted. And he was whispering to her, I don't have enough money. He was embarrassed, I don't have enough money. And she threw an absolute stamp your feet, screaming, hollering in the middle, Wawa! I thought, ay yi yay. But I've seen adults do the same thing. Self-control. Then if you look at verse 6, there's another marker of spiritual growth. Perseverance. Perseverance. Ay ay man, we have so many believers just giving up. I'm not going to pray anymore. It doesn't do any good. I don't see anything happening. I'm not going to witness anymore. Nobody's getting saved. Everybody just laughs at me and feel like a fool when I talk about the Lord. I'm not going to go to church anymore. Nobody else is going to church. I'm not, I can't afford to give anymore to the church. God says perseverance, perseverance, perseverance. Are we growing in the level of perseverance? Virtues, moral excellence. Number two, knowledge. Knowledge of God and everything about our faith. Number three, self-control. Number four, perseverance. Number five, there's a characteristic in verse six of spiritual growth called godliness. Living a godly life. Where when people look at us, they see something different. They may ridicule it. They may laugh at it. They may reject it. They may not accept it. But they know something is different. They may call you names. You're an oddball. You're weird. You're one of those religious so-and-sos. But they see something different in your life that's not in their lives. That would be godliness. Do people see that in your life? Now, I'm not talking about being so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. Please understand that if you're in your house and it's on fire and you're studying God's word, God doesn't expect you to finish the Bible study, get out of the house. If you're on the railroad tracks and the train is coming and you're reading your Bible while you're waiting for triple A, Get out of the car with your Bible and go on. But I am saying we ought to keep growing in the Lord and not be stagnant. We don't know the motives of everybody, but here's a story about a new minister in town, and uh, he was just trying to get to know the neighbors around the church and this was on a mischief night, the night before Halloween, and he just thought he would take a walk around the neighborhood to see if any mischief is being done. And he walked by this house, and here was a little boy trying to jump up on the porch, trying to reach the doorbell, because it was too high for him. He's jumping and he can't make it. Well, he thought he'd help the little boy out. He obviously lived there, wanted to ring the doorbell. So he went up on the porch and said, I'm Pastor so-and-so. <coughs> Uh, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to ring the doorbell as fast as I can. I said, all right, I'll help you out. Ding, 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 ding. And then he said to the little boy, now what are we doing? He said, now, mister, we run like crazy. <laughs> well, we got to be careful about godliness, how we live our lives. That would not be a godly way to live our lives. But are we growing in godliness? And then, number six, verse seven Kindness. Kindness. There are wonderfully kind people in the world, in our lives, in our family, in our circle of friends. But wow, are we not getting more and more acquainted with people who are just plain unkind? We need to be different, though. We need to show the evidence of kindness. Last Wednesday night, our teenagers with Terry Segrist, our youth director, 
um, they were having a dinner, a real dinner. Imagine that, uh, having a real dinner. <laughs> Young people usually eat whatever they want, but the kids wanted chicken and mashed potatoes and veggies and all the good stuff. And so they had a real dinner. And, and uh, so the, there, a lot of it was being cooked in our home next door, and, and it was being ferried over here and through one of the doors to our lower level that was open so they could go and come and go. And here was a homeless man who showed up and saw food and just asked if he could have some food. And Terry jumped in with the teenagers and they made him a platter and fed this guy. And he just made no demands. He was just so grateful. That's an act of random kindness with no strings attached. That's all God wants us to do. You know, Jesus Christ said, when you go and visit someone in the hospital, you're visiting me. When you visit someone in prison, you're visiting me. When you give someone a cup of cold water who's thirsty, you're giving it to me. Act of kindness. Where's that going to get me in this world? Maybe nowhere, but it'll get you a lot to... In God's grace, God says, I'm pleased with you. You're growing in kindness. One of the most wonderful things I love to hear people say is, you know, a few years ago, if that person had said to me today what they said, a few, said to me a few years ago, I would have ripped their face off. But I find myself being kind to them. That's growth. How's your level of growth on a scale of 1 to 10 with kindness? Finally, number 7, love. Love. It is a lie of Satan, hear me well please. It's a lie of Satan. When people say, I can only love those I like. That's just not true. You know what's neat about some families, brothers, sisters, whatever? Man, brothers and sisters can fight like crazy. But you attack one of them, and they all join together. Even though they don't like each other, they still love each other. And, uh, you know, there are Christians I don't like. I uh, don't get your mental church directory out. Because there are Christians that don't like me either. But I'll tell you what. That doesn't mean I don't love them. In recent years, in a lot of years, we've had dear friends of ours absolutely crush Carolyn's of my spirit. Nobody knew about it, but I knew about it. They knew about it. Hurtful, hurtful. But in recent years, they've had it, needed some help. We still help them. Now, I'm not bragging about it. I'm just telling you that's what love's all about. It has nothing to do with liking. And the scriptures tell us just to love. This is not a true story. This is a parable. This really did not happen. But let me just quickly draw your attention to verse 8, and then I'll tell you the parable. In verse 8, it says, For if, ah, that's a big word, isn't it? If. If these qualities, all the ones, the seven that we just mentioned, are yours as believers and are increasing, you're growing up all the time, then they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world may say, you're a, may say to you, you are a fool. You are a religious fanatic. You are out of your mind to do this stuff. People will walk all over you. They'll take advantage of you. And God says, yeah, but if you do these things, you're not useless. You are not unfruitful because you're growing up. The parable is told of man in India who was a water bearer. 
for his master. And every day he would take two pots attached to a pole that he would carry over his shoulders and he would take the two pots down to the river, fill them with water and bring them back to the master's house. This went on for two years. One of the pots was perfectly whole and so when that pot was delivered, it was filled to the top with water. But the other pot had a little crack in it. And so by the time the water bearer got that pot from the river to the master's house, it was half filled. And one day the cracked pot said to the water bearer, I'm so ashamed, I'm so sorry. I fail you. I can't hold the water. I'm cracked. The water bearer said to the cracked pot, as we've walked from the river to the master's house, have you noticed flowers growing along the way? Yes, beautiful flowers. I knew you were a cracked pot. I knew you'd leak water, so I planted flower seeds along the way and as we've been walking for these two years you've been watering the flowers and now I'm able to pick the flowers and give them to the master you and I in our sinful nature are like those cracked pots we're like that cracked pot we're, we're leaking all the time uh, and we need to be refilled and that's what growth is all about if you don't have Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're not growing at all spiritually. You can't without the Holy Spirit. But becoming born again, God gives you new life forevermore. And then he wants you to grow in that life. If you do proclaim Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, here are seven ways to grow up. The question is, are we? growing up. Heavenly Father, these are difficult days in which we live, difficult days to obey your word in when we're surrounded at work and at even sometimes at home and in our families and in our neighborhoods and surrounded by strangers who, who are, live ungodly lives. And so our lives are more difficult to be all that you want us to be. Yet, you still call us to grow up. So, Father, this is a time of the year when we examine ourselves as we think about especially the cross of Jesus Christ and then the resurrection. And we are examining ourselves, Heavenly Father, to see how grown up, grown up we are in these seven characteristics. Heavenly Father, convict us and then show us how to change our ways so that we'll continue to grow as you would have us to do. In the name of Jesus Christ and for his sake we pray together. Amen. Shall we stand and sing unto the Lord? Have you any room for Jesus? If you desire to accept Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, to be baptized by immersion the way Jesus Christ was. You're welcome to come forward and make your decision known to me or speak with me after the service. But let's stand and sing unto the Lord 256. 256. Let's stand and sing together.
Heavenly Father, as we leave this place of worship now, we are about to face individuals and situations that will put us to the test in our faith. May we be positive examples for Jesus Christ in word and in action as we face new people and new situations. May we do so as representatives of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Dismiss us with renewed faith that because Jesus Christ is alive, the best is yet to come. Amen and amen.